Well, thank you. My name is Mike Carey. I'm on the executive committee for the Connecticut Beekeepers Association. Uh, we're a non-profit organization. It's made up of a bunch of beekeepers throughout the state. We're probably one of the oldest beekeepers associations in the country. Our main objective is to educate people about keeping bees. And we have all kinds of levels of, ed of education, starting with things like this. Basically, small groups of people who don't know very much about bees, but are kind of interested, okay? And we come out, talk them about bees, get them started, get them a little bit interested. And then our next level of education would be to do what we call our bee school, where we take people who say, hey, you know what? I think I'd like to try it. I'm not sure I want to get into it, but I want to try it. It's a one-day school. We put on some in January and February. And basically, we take somebody who has no exposure to bees at all, and we give them enough information so that they can go out and make informed decisions about what kind of equipment to procure, how to get their bees, the things that they have to do with their bees for the first year in order to give them a good chance of getting their bees to survive through the winter. Okay. Um, the other parts of our program is we do open hive demonstrations for people that, were, that are new at beekeeping where they can come to one of our apiaries. Uh, a knowledgeable instructor will open up the live bees and teach people about the things that they should be doing with their beehives with actual hands-on presentations throughout their different times of the year. And then the other things that we do we are really targeted towards very experienced beekeepers. We'll bring in speakers from around the country, usually people with doctors, PhDs, and whatnot, who will come out and speak on very specific subjects about beekeeping. Uh, the gentleman who spoke to our last meeting came out and spoke to us about a, something called a horizontal hive, which is a really nice idea because the hives that are typically used now a Langstroth hive, they're vertical hives. So as you want to expand the size of your bee colony, you have to add boxes up on top of the hive. And when you think about it, each one of these boxes can weigh, once it's full of honey, can weigh 60 pounds, 100 pounds. And I know some people who are carrying beehives, they've got hives that are 10 boxes high. And I can't imagine going up on top of a stepladder and picking up a box that weighs 100 pounds full of bees and trying to manipulate it without having an accident. So he was a pretty interesting speaker. That's my plug for the Connecticut Beekeepers Association. That's who we are. That's what we do. Um, we're an education facility. So my, do you keep bees? I'm sorry. Do you have your own hives? I have three hives in my backyard. Um, there's approximately 150,000 bees in my backyard. Oh. My pet bees. <laughs> Don't ask me to name them all. I don't remember. <laughs> I remember the names of the ones who stung me. <laughs> but I'm not going to say them in polite company. <laughs> Do you have problems with like bear or anything else that might come and uh, work with possums or anything else that might like honey? I have problems with bears in my yard. I live in Oxford. Mm -hmm. um, and a couple of years ago, the, bees, the bears came into my yard and tore my hives all apart, spewed them all over the yard, and I ultimately bought an electric fence and put it around my hives, and that worked. And what was interesting about electric fences, an electric fence in itself isn't a very good deterrent to a bear because the bear's hair is so thick that if it rubs up against the, the electrical fence, it's not even going to notice it. So, so to make it work, you have to bait the fence. You have to clip on something like a piece of bacon or something like that. So when the bear comes up to the fence and it goes for that bacon that's hanging off of there, it gets shocked in, in its tender spots. And yeah, the bear let out a big howl that night. I heard it. <laughs> My hives were safe. My neighbors, bird feeders, were not. <laughs> so I know it works. <laughs> you know, I, I, I talked about my bees being pets. Okay, I don't think of my bees as pets. I mean, let's face it, yeah, they're hairy, okay? They're soft, okay? 
but really they're flying hypodermic needles full of poison and they're not especially cuddly. I think of my bees more like domesticated farm animals that I keep in order to raise a crop. So let's take just a few minutes and talk about the kinds of crops that you can get from a beehive. I mean, everybody knows about honey, okay? It's obvious. Bees wax, right? So some people will have beehives and their primary goal will be to get beeswax. People will use the beeswax to make candles. They'll use it for various face creams, hand creams, lip balms, right? You've heard of things like burnt bees and things like that, okay? Candles. But there's a number of other products that come out of the beehive that you don't think about very often, such as pollen, okay? A lot of bee, not a lot, some beekeepers will collect the pollen that the bees bring back to the hive and they'll sell it to people that will use it as like a condiment, a mixture with their yogurt or ice cream or something like that or something to sprinkle onto their salad. So whenever you have a beehive, you, you might have to make adjustments to your beehive depending on the type of crop that you want to collect from your hive. So for example, somebody who wants to collect pollen might have something down here near the entrance to the hive that the bees have to pass through a series of brushes essentially where as the bees pass through the brushes brush the pollen off of their back legs and they collect it and the beekeeper has to go out every day and pick up the pollen and get it refrigerated because it gets nasty if you don't do it daily and that's one other type another type that Another product that you can get from beehives is something called propolis. Propolis, some people call it propolis. And that's basically a, a, a resin type of glue that the bees use to um, stick things together and to seal up cracks that are inside of their hive. Um, it's, it's very sticky, it's very gummy, and my God, you get it in your kitchen sink, forget it, it's gone. You, you, it, you'll never get it out. But there's a market for it in the pharmaceutical industry because it's used as an antiseptic. So people will, can put special things into their hive to cause the bees to produce propolis, makes it easy for them to, prop, to, to harvest the propolis, and they can sell it to the pharmaceutical companies. Okay. Some of the other things that come out of beehives that people don't think about as a crop is just the beehives themselves. Okay, when we think about our food supply, there's so much of our food, I've heard estimates up as high as 75% of the food that we eat requires pollination of some sort by honeybees. There are people who have beehives, they basically keep them on the backs of large trucks and they drive them from farm to farm and do nothing with them except pollinate the particular farmer's crops. Now, it's kind of interesting because when you think about it, the bees that live in the summertime, they only live about six weeks, right? So if a bee goes from one farm and eats blueberries for, six, for, for two or three weeks during the blueberry pollination season, and then it goes to another place, maybe an alfalfa farm, and does that for two or three weeks, and then goes down south to Florida and does oranges for two to three weeks, that's basically like you eating blueberries for 30 years, <laughs> and alfalfa for the next 30 years, and oranges for the next 30 years. It's not a great diverse diet that they're going to get when they're on that type of environment, okay? Another crop that you can get from beehives are the bees themselves. There are a good number of beekeepers who specialize in doing nothing but selling bees to beekeepers. So. They would take a box, something like this, and they'd put three, or three, four, or five pounds of bees into this box. Okay. Let me see if I can do this. So they, sorry. Thank you. So they would dump in. They put this onto a scale. They dump in three or four or five pounds of bees, depending on what the customer wants. 
and they take this can, it's got a couple holes in there, and it would be filled up with some type of a, of a sugar syrup, and they drop it inside here upside down so that while the bees are being transported from the location, probably down south someplace up to the north, they've got something to eat while they're on their way. And they'll also take something like this. This is what's called a queen cage. And they would put a queen inside of this cage and they would seal this cover right here, this little hole here, with a candy plug to keep the queen inside. And they would support this in here. Now they have to keep the queen inside of this cage for a specific reason. Bees are very, very specific about who their queen is. They want to have a queen around them, but they want it to be their queen. Now, in these farms, there'd be people, they, they may take bees from 20 or 30 different hives and dump them into this bucket. And then they're gonna go over and they're gonna grab a queen from someplace else, from a, some other hive, and put her in here and stick her in here. Well, all these bees in here are gonna say, hey, that's not my queen, okay? And they're going to try to kill her. So they have to put the bee, the queen, inside of a protective cage and set her in here, all right? Now after she stays in there for four days, five days, maybe up to a week, the bees will first of all recognize, hey, my queen is gone, but there's a new queen here, and after a certain amount of time, they'll accept this new queen as their queen, and they'll move on quite happily. And that's the purpose of the candy plug, because that candy plug is going to be eaten away by both the queen and the bees, and it's going to take about a week for that candy plug to be beaten, to be eaten away, just enough time for the bees to get used to the new queen, and then they, she, can, she can be released safely. You can pass this around if you want to take a look at it. So when a beekeeper gets one of these, there are a whole bunch of different procedures that you can follow to get them into the hive. Um, Probably the fastest one is to just take out the can, take out the queen, and dump the bees into the hive. <laughs> put the queen in, put the queen inside of her cage inside of the hive, and let them get acclimated. But that's kind of a quick overview. There's a, there's quite a bit to installing a, a package of bees, and there are a whole bunch of different procedures that you can follow, really depending on the time of the year and how much time that you want to spend doing the installation. Yes, ma'am. inside that little hole. With what? Your hands? Your fingers. Your fingers. See, the queen bee has, has a stinger, okay? But she rarely uses it um, to attack predators or people or anything like that. She uses that primarily when she's fighting with other queens. So if another queen were to come into her hive, or if the bees were to generate another queen inside of their hive, the queens would fight it out and they would use their stingers in order to determine who is going to be the queen of the hive. Now, her stinger is a little bit different than the stingers on the other bees because her stinger is kind of like a sewing needle. It can go in and come out and come in, go in and come out several times. Where the stinger on the worker bees that you see inside of this box here have a barb on the end. So once the stinger goes in, it's very, very difficult for the bee to pull it out. Now, most of the time when a worker bee stings you, the barb goes in, it injects the poison, and then the bee tries to pull away, and in the process, um, the stinger and a gland, a venom sac essentially, remains behind, gets pulled out of, the, out of the bee's body and it remains behind. And that venom sac has a muscle attached to it that just sits there and pulsates and keeps pumping the venom into the victim. Great, huh? <laughs> Except that it kills the bee, right? Yes. It, it, it kills the bee and, and, the, and, the, and the bee dies because of that tearing apart. Now, sometimes Bees are lucky. It were, if they'll sting you, the, the bee will sometimes like fly around in a circle, 
trying to disengage the stinger and sometimes they're successful. They can actually disengage the stinger without pulling it out of their body and they can fly off and live on for another happy day. But most of the time, it doesn't wind up that nicely. Yes, ma'am. Aren't there some people who believe that bee venom is used for like uh, curing arthritis and things like that? So they'll use like, I forget what it's called, but it's a certain type of medicine. Um, I, I've heard of that. I don't know much about it. Right. Um, I, I know. I that homeopathic. Uh, and uh, spectrum, right? I, I know how much I like getting stung by bees, and I'd have to be very, very sick before I just <laughs> before I go for something like that. <laughs> First line. Yes, ma'am. Our row never got that queen cage. Oh, here you go. <laughs> Thank you. So that's. That's kind of uh, the crops. Yeah, let me see, there was one other crop I wanted to talk about. Yeah, queen bees. Okay, another crop that pe some people will raise bees just to raise queens. Now, I mentioned that the bees are domesticated animals. Now, like most other domesticated animals, like horses and cattle and sheep, there are different breeds of each of those animals. And the same with our honeybees. There are different breeds of honeybees. So there are going to be beekeepers who specialize in breeding queens. So they're going to breed queens for very specific behaviors. Okay? Sometimes they're going to breed them for honey production. They want a bee that's going to produce a good amount of honey. Um, sometimes they're going to breed queens based on the climate that the bees are going into. For example, a bee that lives really, really well in the Amazon may not be able to survive the winters up here in the Northeast, so they would breed for the climate. They'll breed for various disease resistances. Um, they'll breed for cleanliness in housekeeping. Okay, sometimes you want a group of bees that are going to be very aggressive at keeping the hive clean. They'll breed for that. They'll even breed for temperament. Okay, and you, and you, and, and you smile. <laughs> but I can tell you that the bees that I keep in my backyard, if I get my bees mad at me, they might send five or ten bees out of the hive to chase me for about 15 or 20 feet, and they'll say, hmm, enough of that. We're going home. <laughs> but you've heard of Africanized bees, okay. They may send 20 or 30,000 bees out of the hive and they may chase you for a, half, for a half mile, okay. Very, very different temperament. And one of the things that I know, yes ma'am. What would you do to get the bees mad at you? I'm sorry? What would you have done to get the bees mad at you? Oh, act like a bear. <laughs> I say that in jest, partially, okay. The bear is probably the, one of the biggest predators to a bee, okay. Um, and think about what a bear looks like. It's big, you know, about the size, you know, a small bear is about the size of a big person. They're black, right. That's why you see beekeepers wearing white suits, so we don't look like a bear. Okay, beekeepers have to be pretty particular about their hygiene because we don't want to smell like a bear. <laughs> okay, um, when a bear comes into a hive, it thrashes things around and it moves quickly and makes all kinds of noise, so we want to move quietly slowly, almost like you're doing a ballet. So when you're manipulating your stuff, you do it very slowly and very quietly. Experienced beekeepers, and I'm not quite there yet, will actually work their hives without gloves because they will move so slowly, they've learned how to move so slowly, they've learned the dance so that they can do it without getting stung. I've still got some practice. I wear my gloves. <laughs> um, those, are, those are the big things. Sunglasses, okay. Don't wear your sunglasses when you're working around your hive because you're going to look like a big-eyed bear, right? 
basically, the bees are not leaving their hive, running around looking for people to sting. When they're leaving their hive, they're going out looking for food or water, and they're coming back. That's their objective. Um, they will protect themselves. So if you see a bee and you swat at it, you can count on getting stung. Um, when I get stung, it's usually because I've done something wrong. Okay. Uh, the most common place that I get stung is it right here. Okay. I've got my socks on, a bee will crawl up my shoe, and I'll move, and my shoe will pinch between, it will pinch the bee in, and I'll get stung. Now, when the bee stings me, I'm toast for the rest of the day. Because when it stings me, it leaves a marker on my skin telling all the other bees where the enemy is. Okay? And it's accurate. Okay? <laughs> Last time I was in my hive, I got pinched right here. Okay? And within an hour, for no provocation at all, I got three more stings within that distance from that original sting just because they smelled that odor, that target odor on my skin. Okay? Hmm. Now, in your experience, I've heard that the odor is very similar to bananas. I've heard that too. Um, and I also saw an experiment where somebody took some bananas, banana peels, and they laid them down on top of the bees, and the bees just ignored them. So I don't know. I don't know. We don't take a chance. <laughs> <laughs> don't risk it. <laughs> the, it's, I'll get you, the, the other thing that's going to cause bees to get excited are going to be if you interfere with their hive. They're going to be very protective of their hive and their food supply. So very early in the season, when there's hardly any food in the hive, the bees are probably going to be a lot more gentler. But as when you start coming into September and October, once they've got a huge amount of food in there, they're going to be a lot more testy because they're going to be defending their territory. Okay? And, and their babies, too. They're protecting their babies. And the queen. The brood. I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure what their motivation is, whether it's the food, the brood, or the combination. The other thing that if they're being attacked by wasps or yellow jackets or things on that line, mm -hmm. towards the hive, there's a good chance that since they're already in this defensive mode, you may just become a target yourself. Oh, yeah. I mean, right now I can hear my bees are angry. Mm -hmm. They don't like being inside of this box. And, and if anybody wants to come up in... Uh, well, we can hear them here. But if you, if you want to come up and smell the vent holes, you, you, you might get a, an idea of what that al alarm pheromone smells like. See, when bees communicate, they got two main methods of communication. One of them is by odor, okay? Bees release a chemical called a pheromone that has a particular odor. It's kind of like a perfume. And these odors, and, they, and they'll release some 200 different odors. And these odors all mean something. So, for example, um, I, have a, I have a bee trap here that, that I can use if I want to catch some bees. Okay, and I would bait this trap by putting in something that smells like a, a come here scent that tells the bees, hey, come here, this is a safe place to set up a new house. Okay, um, and I've got some on here, you can pass some of that around and get a, get a feel for what that smells like. Okay, but they have some 200 different odors in their vocabulary if you can think of it like that. One of the odors that we talked about was that odor where they say, hey, come sting them right here. Somebody's already got me there. Another one is going to be an alarm pheromone where if they sense a predator coming by, they're going to put up an alarm pheromone and they're going to tell the bees in the hive, hey, get ready, we need to defend ourselves. 
Okay. Um, so on your cotton ball, is that lemongrass oil? That's a lemongrass oil, yes. Okay. We knew a woman who um, would retain her queens and she put a little bit of, um, she put, was it just water or like other clear? Or something like that. She was too yeah, clear. No. And there were queens that, were pe- that had passed. Mm-hmm. She would keep them in a jar and make a tincture. Yep. She would use that for, along, uh, with, 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 along with lemongrass. As a bait? As a bait, yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, how's that? Thanks. Thank I'll just put these aside here. You said the bees live for around six weeks. What mm-hmm. happens to when that dies? Do they stay in the hive? Do they kick them out? What, what do they do with them? Okay, so... Okay, I'm going to... Okay, I'll answer that. Then I'm going to kind of jump off into the, into the beehive itself and the various bees. Um, the worker bees, okay. These are all female bees. 95% of the bees in the hive are female bees, okay? And as they move through life, they have different jobs based on what the hive needs at a particular time and their own physical maturity. One of the jobs that the bees have is what they call a mortuary bee. So as the bees die and they land in the bottom of the hive, the mortuary bees will pick them up and sometimes they'll just throw them out in the front of the hive. Sometimes I've seen them actually pick them up and fly them off. Okay? And they do that to keep the hive clean. Okay? So let's just talk, spend a few minutes. Oh, I wanted to finish talking about how bees communicate too. We talked about the odors, how they have all these different odors that they can give off that, to send different signals. Another thing that they do is called a dance, all right? Some folks might have heard of it. (laughs) You look at me like I'm crazy. Bees don't dance. Get out of here. (laughs) Okay, well, they do dance. When a bee comes back to the hive full of food, it sends a message to the other bees that are getting ready to leave about where to find the food, okay? So... They're able to communicate the location of the food. Now they can tell the bees that are going out what kind of food to go look for, which direction they have to fly in order to find the food, how far they have to fly in order to find the food, and how much food is actually there. Okay? Now it's a real interesting stance that they do. It's kind of kind of crazy, but let me see if I can show it to you. Well, I'm not going to dance, believe me. (laughs) So inside of the hive, we have these frames, okay? So when that bee comes back after, after getting its food, it's going to start doing a dance. And it's going to have a straight line component. The bee is going to walk in a straight line, like this, and then it's going to do a loop, and come back, walk in that same straight line again, then loop in the opposite direction, and walk in that same straight line again. Now, as it's walking in that straight line, it's shaking its abdomen. Now, the more times the bee shakes its abdomen, the farther away the food is from the hive. Okay? And it's really quite specific numbers, okay? There are people that have studied this and charted it out so that they can really pin it down to pretty good distances as to how far that bee has to go in order to find food. Now, in order to determine what direction the bee has to go into, so if the bee is doing that straight line dance straight from the bottom of the hive up to the top of the hive, The bees know to come out of the front of the hive here, look for the sun, and fly straight to the sun. Okay? Now they know what direction, and they know know how far. Okay? Now, if the bee is doing that straight line component of the dance, a little bit to the, what is that, the right side of the sun? Okay? They're going to come out, they're going to look for the sun, and they're going to go the exact number of degrees 
towards the sun, away from the sun, I'm sorry, in order to get to that bee, in order to get to that food. The bees are going to know how much food is there by the intensity of that abdomen shake. If they're giving it a gentle shake, they're saying, eh, there's not that much food there. But if they're really giving it a good hard shake, they know there's a lot of food out here. Okay? There's a lot of food out here. And then secondly, as the bees do in the dance, the foragers are going to gather around it and they're going to use their antenna because that's where they smell. They don't have noses. They're going to use their antenna to smell the type of food that that bee has just collected. So now they know what kind of food to go look for. So they use that dance to communicate, to tell each other where the food supplies are. And it works. It works real well. I made the mistake towards the end of the summer of leaving my basement doors open. Oh. And I had some of these frames in my basement that had some honey in there. Oh. And I went out and I says, oh, there's a bee flying around my basement. And a half hour later, there were several thousand bees in my basement. They, they delivered the message that quickly. Okay? <laughs> so it was kind of fun. All right, so let's talk for a few minutes about the beehive itself. All right? Several components. This is what they call a standard Langstroth 10 frame hive. Okay? It's the most common hive that you get. There are a number of other varieties out there that. You know, they've all got their pros and cons, but this is the most common one that's available right now. And the first part is called a top cover. And it's basically just something to keep the rain out, okay? This top cover has got about that much insulation inside of here that, that I put in when I build them to help the bees stay warm. Because remember, I told you that the bees that live in the summertime live about six weeks. Because they're working, they're basically working themselves to death. However, the bees that live in the wintertime, they have a very different life, a very different set of responsibilities. Their sole responsibility is to maintain the temperature of the hive. And they do that by grabbing some food that they've stored, building up a little bit of energy and shaking. Then they go to sleep and they get some more food and they shake some more. And that's what they do for their entire six month long life. That's their sole objective is to maintain the temperature of the hive. Now, so they're eating a lot of the honey, which is like 18% water. And that water has to go someplace, so it's going, it's collecting inside of the hive. So there has to be some method to remove that water from the hive. Sometimes beekeepers will actually prop open the hive a little bit like that to let some of the moisture out. Okay? And the problem with doing that is when the, when the warm, moist air goes out, it gets replaced with cold air. Now the bees have to work harder in order to maintain the temperature. And when they work harder, they're eating more honey. All right? So people are saying that if you're in that ventilation mode here in Connecticut, you've got to put some, somewhere in the area of 100 pounds of honey into the hive at the beginning of the winter in order to make sure that the bees have enough honey. I mean, the new thing now is to try to add levels of ventilation onto the of insulation onto the, you know the top of the hive, sometimes around the sides, um, so that the hive stays warmer and the bees don't need to eat as much honey. Because if the bees don't need to eat as much honey, that's more honey for me to sell. Okay, it's worth the extra money for the insulation. Okay. The next component of the hive is what we call the inner cover. It's basically, its main purpose is to give me a way so that I can take a quick look inside and see what's going, inside, see what's going on inside of the bees uh, hive without having to really open it up all the way and get the bees all irritated. And it also serves as a way to feed the bees. Okay, remember they're domesticated animals. Okay, you see cows, they'll go out 
in the pasture all through the summer, and they'll eat their their grain and, and whatever they can fa- they, whatever they can find. But in the winter time, they have nothing. The farmer has to feed them something. Well, the bees are kind of like that. The bees during the summertime, they'll go out and they'll collect food and they'll bring it back to the hive and they'll store it. But as a beekeeper, we have to monitor the amount of food that they're stored because if they don't have that 100 pounds of food going into the winter, we have to figure out a plan to make sure that they're fed. So late July, early August, we're paying really close attention to the amount of food that's in the hive. And if we don't think that there's going to be enough food in there to get that 100 pounds, we have to start feeding it. And the way we do it is we take a jar, I mean, there, there are all kinds of different devices that have been invented to, to easily feed the beehives, but I'm cheap, so I have my high-tech pickle jar, and basically poke some holes in the top, water and sugar, a 50-50 solution, okay? Okay, it stops after a few minutes. And I'll set it over that little cover. The bees can climb up inside. They'll be able to sip some sugar water from the little holes and feed themselves. Now, my bees in August were storing almost a gallon of water a day, of sugar water a day, in order to build their prop, in order to build their their stores. We've had two really tough summers. Last summer there was a drought. Okay, the flowers just didn't produce enough nectar for the bees. This year, there was plenty of rain, plenty of nectar, but it was too rainy and too cold for the bees to be flying. So they didn't go out and get the nectar. So we had a problem with honey supplies this year. Most everybody I know are feeding their bees this summer in order to make them so that they can survive the winter. You know, getting, yes ma'am. Well, are you harvesting any honey then? Well, my first year I harvested a grand total of six pounds. My second year, nothing. This year, nothing. You're just feeding them now. Yeah, and it was really disappointing to me because when I first started beekeeping, everyone's telling me, you know, you get a good hive on a good year, you got 100 pounds of honey. And I'm sitting here thinking, boy, 100 pounds of honey at $10 a jar? Oh, boy. (laughs) Not yet. (laughs) Not yet. Okay. So that's the inner cover and its function. Now, I call these the boxes. They have very specific names. Usually when you see these, the boxes will be a little bit larger. Okay, there's two of them that would go on the bottom. The bottom one is the one where the bees are going to be um, raising their brood, essentially. The one that's on top of it will be the one where the bees are going to store the honey that they're going to keep for the winter. And then the ones on top of that will be the ones where the beekeepers are going to put the boxes on so that they can get any extra honey for themselves. Okay? They're basically a box with no bottom on it. Okay? No bottom, no top. Okay? And inside of the box, we have what are called frames. Okay? And I'm going to pass these around. Please feel them. Smell them, touch them, <laughs> okay? Basically what the frame is, it's, it's a wooden frame, kind of like a picture frame. And I've installed onto mine a plastic foundation which has the shape of a honeycomb already stamped into it. And these are coated with beeswax already to kind of entice the bees to start building up wax honeycomb on top of it. So after the bees have been installed in the hive, and after the bees start bringing pollen and honey back into the hive, that signals them that they've got plenty of energy. And then they start taking that honeycomb pattern and they start adding wax to it and they start building up a honeycomb. You can pass those around too. And here you go. 
and they and they build it up. Okay, thanks. And and they build it up, and they build it up until it gets kind of thick. All right. All set. Thank you. And you can see that, that, that this one's got a whole bunch of fingerprints in there because I do this presentation to preschoolers and they just love to feel in touch. <laughs> and, they, and they build up their honeycomb like that. Now, the honeycomb serves three purposes. One of them, it gives the bees a place to store their honey. It gives the bees a place to store the pollen that they collect. And it gives the bees a place to raise their brood. So the queen can lay her egg in there and allow the, the egg to develop into a pupae and then emerge as a full-grown bee. All right? So what I have here Why don't you take a look at these? These might be a little bit sticky, so so please be careful with them. Okay. okay. The, yeah, these are combs where the bees have have capped honey. So so how do the bees make honey? All right. Oh, I've lost everybody now. <laughs> So, so, how do, so how do the bees make that stuff? Okay. Well, a bee goes out to the flower and she sticks her tongue or her proboscis into the flower and sips up some nectar from that flower. And she stores that nectar in one of two stomachs. She has one stomach that's used for digest for digestion for thank you. She has one stomach that's used for digest digestion for her own nutrients and she has another one called a honey stomach where she basically stores this nectar that she's collected. So she'll put it into that honey stomach and when it's in there she's adding enzymes to that honey all right now she may have to go and visit some 10,000 flowers in order to fill up her honey stomach on her trip okay all set thank you so as she so once so once she's visited all these flowers and she starts flying back she's going to take some of the nutrients from that honey to fuel her flight back home. Okay, But when she gets back home, she's going to fly into the hive and she's going to go up to one of the bees whose job it is to unload the foragers and she's going to take that nectar and pass it to the next bee who's going to put it into her honey stomach and add some more enzymes and take some nutrients from it. Okay? And then that bee is going to pass it on to another bee who's going to add some more enzymes. And she's going to pass it on to another bee to add some more enzymes. Until at some point, and I don't know how they've made the conclusion, they say, hey, we've got enough enzymes in here. All right? And they're going to drop that drop of honey inside of one of the cells. Okay? It's not honey yet, though. It's still nectar, okay? It's got way, way, way too much water in it to be honey. So the next thing the bees do, after they've got all of these cells that are all full of this very, very moist nectar, they strategically position themselves throughout the hive. And they start fanning. They just stand there and they fan their wings. And they create, and, and they do it in a very specific location and pattern so that they draw air into the hive, bring it up, and then expel the moist air so that they can evaporate this extra water vapor that's inside of the nectar. Now, once this nectar comes down to about 18% water, then they're going to say, okay, this is good enough, and we're going to put this cap on here that you see here, okay? 
the enzymes continue doing their curing process and it eventually becomes honey. Now once this stuff is capped, it, it'll, it will last for, for virtually forever. They found it in King Tut's tomb, all right, and it was still edible, all right. So when you go home, you know, you look at your jar of honey. How do they do that cap that you were talking about? How do they do oh, they, they, um, they use a process that's very similar to the... Um, to, to the uh, using wax, you know, when they build up their, their wax cells, they will put wax over the top of the cell to cap it with wax. Okay? So that's how they get honey. Alright? But they also collect pollen, too. And they, they got a real interesting way of collecting pollen. And you folks are all flower people, so you know more about flowers than I do. And I'm I'm about to demonstrate my ignorance here, but <laughs> basically, if, if you can imagine a flower here, mm -hmm. okay, <laughs> that's covered with pollen, all right, and a bee, all right. So as the bee is flying through the air, its body is rubbing against the air. Very much. I don't have any hair left, so I can't do that. <laughs> All right. Very much like the balloon is rubbing against my shirt here, okay? So the balloon is building up a static electric charge. As the bee flies through the air, it also builds up a static electric charge. There's a positive charge on the balloon, okay? There's a negative charge on the flower. So, and I hope I got enough static on me. <laughs> So as the bee hits the flower, the pollen actually jumps from the flower onto the bee because of the static electric charge. And the, bee, the bee's entire body gets covered with pollen. So it's not like the bee is going around picking up little bits of pollen from here and there. The bee, can, the bee yeah, it's covered in it. So, so when the bee... Then, then it's covered with pollen. She, she flies off and she takes her front leg and she scoops some off and passes it to her middle leg and scoops some of it off and passes it to her back leg where she has a special little thing. You got the picture right there. Okay. Please, yeah. Where, where there's a... Yeah. Okay. Where there's, where there's a big ball of pollen that's stored on the back of the bee. But something else happens too. There's something else happens. You see, this has the positive charge on it, and this has a negative charge on it. So when the positive bee hits the negative flower, you, you've basically neutralized the charge on the flower. So now the flower no longer has a negative charge on it. It has a neutral charge. So when the next bee comes flying along, don't ask me how they do it, they can recognize that this flower no longer has that negative charge because somebody's already been here. Um, like a, it's, and it's, get a negative charge again, like over the next couple days or yes, something? Yes, yes. My, um, my understanding is that they also do a pheromone on the flower so that they know that. that okay. That's something I, I, I don't know about, but I mean, you, it's, I mean, it's just what it makes sense. It certainly makes sense, too. Okay? So you've heard that a bee won't visit the same flower twice? That's one of the reasons why not. And again, you know, the, the, the pheromone is also a very logical explanation, too. Okay? So that's how the bees are going to collect their pollen. Ah, let's see, what else did I want to talk about? Um... Let's talk about some of the challenges to the bees that we're getting too. All right, the, the big challenges nowadays to the bees, first of all, is their habitat. Okay, we, we talked about how, how how the bees that are going out on these trucks and going to a farm and doing this and that. Okay, hey, look, it. I don't want to I don't want to disparage that because after all, if they didn't do that, we would not eat. Okay, and it's real. <laughs> we, so it's something that has to be done. Um, 
if, if you're looking at a backyard beekeeper like myself, you know, bees have a foraging range of around two and a half to three miles from their hive, so they can be in a circle that's six miles in diameter collecting food. Well, where I live, there's all kinds of sources in the springtime because that's when everything comes into season. So they can get all kinds of different nutrients as they're going out looking for food. Um, but in the summertime, there's hardly anything in bloom. So my bees aren't collecting any food. They may be, they're not collecting any nectar there may be some flowers that are still hanging around with some pollen. They may be bringing pollen back in. And then here in the Northeast, we also get another time kind of in fall when the things like the ragweed start coming out and some of the fall things coming out. That's another time when we're starting to collect more nectar because there's a second bloom. Okay? So as gardeners, all right, if you want to do things to make bees happy, Right? <laughs> Try thinking about summertime flowers, okay, here in the Northeast, so that the bees have something that they can go to during that, what we call the dearth, which is the period where there's nothing blooming for the bees to eat. Um, when you're choosing flowers for bees, remember that the proboscis, the, the bee's tongue, is, is short. So if you get something that, so if you get a flower that's got that real long trumpet shape, and the bee can't stick its proboscis down to the bottom to get the nectar out, nice flower for a butterfly, but it's not going to help the bees. So you want to look at short flowers, all right? Um, also look for flowers that have the guides on them, okay? You see, bees, bees got really crazy eyes. <laughs> um, they've got five eyes. They've got three of them in the back. One, two, three. And they basically see black and white. They don't see objects very well. And they basically use those to um, see the sun even through the clouds for navigation purposes. Okay? And then they've got the two big eyes up in the front of their heads. Okay? Now those eyes see in color and they also see in black and white and they have the ability to switch color on switch color off okay so when they're out there flying around and they don't need to see the details of the color they can conserve energy and switch off the color but when they get up close to the flowers and they want to see the particular flowers that they're going for they'll switch the color back on now when they're looking at color you know humans can see the colors of the rainbow Roy G. Biv, right? Well, bees have a different spectrum that they see in. They don't see red, okay? Things that we see as red, they see as black, all right? Um, but bees also see colors that we can't see. The, the brightest color or the highest spectrum color we see is ultraviolet. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, is violet. But bees can see beyond that and can see ultraviolet. So if you take a look at a flower, and you might look at the flower and say, hey, this is a pretty yellow flower. Well, to the bee, it looks very different because there are oftentimes infrared, I'm sorry, not infrared, ultraviolet colors on that petal that, will, that the bee can see that will tell the bee where the pollen and where the nectar is on that flower. So if you're thinking about planting flowers for your bees, read up and see whether or not they've got these ultraviolet guides that are going to bring the bees into their food supply. And remember I told you about the dance that they do in order to locate the food? See, when a bee goes out looking for food, it's not going out just on a random jaunt. It's got a very specific place that it's going to and it's looking for a very specific food. So. If that bee says, hey, I'm going out looking for a daisy, if you got one daisy there, it might have wasted a real long trip. So plant big bunches of flowers, <laughs> really big bunches of the same flower. So when the bee comes out, it's going to have 
the 10,000 flowers that it needs in order to fill up its honey sack for its trip home. Okay? Ah, let's see. We're 8 o'clock. <laughs> um, I think I've pretty well hit the things that I wanted to talk about. Do you have questions? What is royal jelly? Okay. Royal jelly is a it's a food that the bees generate. The, 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 oh, I know something else I didn't talk about yet. That the, the bees generate from a, a gland in their neck. Okay? They use it to feed the queen. So once the queen is out, she is fed only royal jelly for the rest of her life. It's a very, very high concentration of minerals that she needs because she has one job in life and that's to produce eggs. And she's a very, very, she produces a lot of eggs. So she, so she needs a lot of royal jelly. Um, royal jelly is also used to feed the eggs that the bee, that the queen lays. So for two or three days after the egg is laid, those eggs are immersed into a pool of royal jelly and those eggs will grow based on that royal jelly. Now, after two or three days, the worker bees get switched to a different diet. Um, instead of getting royal jelly, they're going to get a combination of pollen and honey, something called bee bread. Okay? And that's what they're going to have put inside of their cells until they develop. And that bee bread has the nutrients for them, but it also makes those bees sterile so that they can't reproduce. So the only bee in the hive that can do any reproductive function is the queen bee. Okay, sir? Well, actually, um, most of your workers can also lay eggs, but they won't lay drone eggs. Right. Okay. Um, That's getting into the level two, I think. <laughs> okay. I, I mean, well, one other thing I would like to talk about, especially for this group, is um, pesticides. Yep. Okay. Yep. Pesticides, neonicotinoids, right? All right. Um, we talked about the things that, that threaten bees. The habitat is one. I mean, pesticides are another. I mean, Hey, I let the dandelions in my front yard grow. All right, I don't. I don't care if my grass is green. You know, I've got special segments of my yard where the clover just runs wild, and they love it. You know, if you if you constantly go around knocking down the pesticides um, in your yard and in your gardens, the bees are going to pick up the pesticides when they forage. They're going to bring the pesticides back into their hive. The pesticides are going to be impregnated into the wax. And they're going to build a home out of material that kills them. Mm -hmm. And the okay? that you produce yeah. pesticides. Yeah. Now, am I going to stand here and tell you to ban pesticides? Absolutely not. My God, you've got to feed the people in the world and if we don't use pesticides on the crops that we use, that we eat, we're going to starve. We just don't have the capacity to feed the world's population without using pesticides. But you need to be thoughtful about which ones you use because you don't want things that are going to get into the food chain. You don't want things that are going to kill off the honeybees. And it's not that I'm, I mean, I, look, I like honeybees, and, and, but I'm a realist. Yeah. If, if, if the honeybees go, 75% of our food supply goes. Okay? There's a couple other things. So you, you could do pesticides at nighttime um, while the bees are in their hives. And that way, or not on a windy day, right? So that you keep the pesticide, you know, more <coughs> limited to exactly where you want to put it. Yeah. So that's one thing. And the other thing for pollination, besides the honeybees, is you can set up pollinator hotels for the mason bees and the native bees that also do a lot of pollination. Mm -hmm. It's not a honey source, but it is a way of supporting pollination. The, um, mm -hmm. One other source is be careful on plants by. I'm sorry. Be careful about the plants that you buy because yep. a lot of seeds are treated with pesticides. Yep. And those pesticides last for the life of the plant. Yep. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and, and they, yeah, and, and, and the plant will actually put that pesticide into the pollen, mm -hmm. and the bees will bring the pollen back and they'll eat it. Um, Which plants are those? Like, like, how do you know if that's a problem? Well, for a while, Home Depot plants that you, the nurseries were actually treating all their plants and trees and other things with pesticides, uh, seeds, and yeah, seeds. Yeah, or whatever. Um, so that they were not susceptible to insect damage. Mm -hmm. We're starting to do less and less of that, but for at least through next year, Home Depot and Lowe's are still selling plants with pesticides. I think they promised to stop it by 2018. But some of the nurseries are still selling other plants. So you have to look at the label, make sure that you talk to the nursery providers, make sure that they are, and that you care about pesticide-free plants. Because it's not just when the middle it's the life, the life of the plant. Yes, yeah, it absolutely. It goes through the life of the plant. And, and so anytime a bee comes into that plant for however long the plant's alive, it's going to bring but, the stuff um, back. As Janine was saying, is some people, if they're spraying like an apple tree or a pear tree, um, and they spray it during the day while the bees are on foraging, okay, um, the bees will hit that plant, and all it takes is a few to bring it back mm -hmm. into the hive. Um, you do the same pesticide early in the morning or at night um, as per the direction of the pesticide. Yeah, yeah, and, and some of the pesticides have pretty clear instructions about not applying it while the plant's in bloom, because because that's when the bees are going to be out there grabbing the stuff that's on the plant and bringing it home. So, ah, that's appetite. I mean, yes, sir. Yeah. So, so how do you encourage your local native bees if you're not actually trying to? Make a beehive. They just want to make a bee-friendly place and still just have lots of flowers at different, all different times of the year. That's it. Yep, a good habitat. You know, and it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, garden plants. I mean, there are a lot of trees that are really great, you know, flower producers. You know, the fruit trees, the apples, the pears, the cherry trees, um, maple trees. You know, um, red bud. Yeah, there, there are all kinds of trees. And, and the stuff in your stuff that grows in your front lawn is good stuff. And uh, letting the dandelions grow, right? Yeah. And yeah. clover. I love them. <laughs> hey, I eat I eat I eat the dandelion greens. They make a wonderful salad. If you did a Google search on pollinator hotel, yeah. you could see uh, different ideas for creating mason bee type of homes. Um, as, a, as, a, as a, an individual bee, yeah. you know, it's not really a hive. Even so things like water sources mm -hmm. are great for bees. You know, you have to water to keep the hive cool. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of things to do to encourage local and honey bees to uh, and, and, you know, and, and the other thing here is, I mean, as far as keeping bees happy, one of the things that beekeepers have to do is monitor our bees for various parasites and diseases. Okay, the, probably the largest problem for bees in the Northeast nowadays contained inside this little bag here. They're, they're little mites. Okay, they're called varroa mites. And I'll pass these around. You, you can see they're, they're the little brown dots in here. Okay. And you, you're going to need the magnifier to see them. Okay. But what these do is they, they attach themselves to the bee and they feed off of the bee's hemolymph, which is not good for the bee. But the major problem is that while they're doing that, they're transmitting all kinds of viruses into the bee colony. Okay, and this is probably the major problem for bee collapses in, I mean, in, in the Northeast nowadays. So we're, we're monitoring these and we're treating for these religiously in order to keep these things in check. How do you treat those? There are a number of different methods that are legal to use in the state, um, and it depends oftentimes on the degree of infestation and the time of the year that you're using it. Some of the things um, are more organic in nature, like the uh, oxalic acid and the formic acid, okay? But there are limitations to each one. So for the oxalic acid, they're, they're going to kill the, the mites that are on the bees, okay? But they're not going to kill the mites that are 
capped in the brood, okay, where the formic acid will do that, okay. So, so there are all kinds of trade-offs. Then there are other ones that are just plain old strong miticides that are nerve agents that will kill the mites too. All right? It really depends on how bad your infestation is and where your hives are in relationship to the season and the uh, honey flows. Okay? Yeah. Two questions. How long does it take from to go to eggs to a baby bee or whatever? And how does the queen bee become the queen bee? Two questions. Uh, to go from an egg to an adult worker bee is 21 days. To go from an egg to an adult male bee called a drone is 24 days. Um, to go from an egg to a queen, I'm stretching it. I think it's 16 days, but I'm not positive. Okay. Um, okay. And how does a queen be formed, right? Okay. All right, that's, that's a good question. Um, when a queen goes laying eggs, she, she goes and she drops an egg into one of the cells that I showed you, okay? And the bees, the worker bees will feed that egg royal jelly for three days and then switch over to the bee bread. Well, when the worker bees realize that we're not happy with this queen anymore, maybe she's not laying enough eggs, okay? Maybe the queen has died. Okay, she's, she's, she's no longer in the hive. They say, we need a new queen. So the first thing that they're going to do is they're going to start building special sized cells. These cells protrude off the side of the frame and they, they look about like my finger sticking out there. All right. And then the worker bees will go and grab one of these cell, one of these eggs that the queen has laid and they'll put it into that cell. And they'll start feeding that cell royal jelly until they're ready to cap the cell. And then they'll cap the cell and some 20, what is 16 days later, the, uh, the new queen will emerge. Now, they'll do this with probably four or five or six different queen cells so that they have a really high probability that they're going to get a good queen come out. Now, the first queen that comes out, the first thing that she does is she goes around to the rest of the queen cells and she kills off the queens that are in there because she, she, she's going to be the queen of the roost. <laughs> okay? So, uh, there's a cool video uh, actually online um, that shows uh, a, 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 an egg you know, growing. So it'll show you, it's got a visual of the you know, the cells of the hive, and it'll show the eggs growing and then emerging. So, it's pretty cool. One thing I think the group would like, if you could talk about the life of the drone, and what happens to the drone. And... Okay. <laughs> All right. So, so, so... There are, are mostly women in this room, so, yeah. you know, we might like that story. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to take a little art... I, I, I'm going to take a little artistic license here. <laughs> Um, when, when my daughter went off to college, I said to her, you know, you're going to meet some guys out there. And I said, if they, if they act like a drone, treat them like a drone. <laughs> All right? Now, so let's talk about the differences between the worker bees and the drones. Okay? The worker bees, they're the female bees. There's like 95% of the bees in the hive are females. The rest of the bees, the remaining 5% are the males. How are they different? Well, the male bees don't have stingers. If you are good enough to recognize the difference between a male bee and a female bee, you could pick up a male bee and you could pat it and play with it and do whatever you want with it and you're perfectly safe. It hasn't got a stinger. But please, don't try this, because I don't want you to get stung in case you're wrong. <laughs> All right. They got bigger eyes. Okay, they got bigger eyes. So, so a male bee can't defend the hive. All right? It's useless in that regard. Um, the male bee doesn't have a honey sack. 
so it can't go out and collect food. Okay? The male bee doesn't have the pollen packs on the back legs, so it can't go out and collect pollen. The male bee doesn't have the glands to produce royal jellies, so it can't feed the young. What else do the male bees can't do? The male bees, with regard to the function of the hive, oh yeah, the male bees don't have wax glands either, so they can't construct the hive. So with regard to the functioning of the hive that they live in, they are essentially useless. Okay, But they're terribly important in, in the reproduction system, okay, because if well, you know you know what happens if people don't do it, right? Okay. Um, so they're they're basically useless. And at the end of the summer time, the bees recognize that. Oh, oh, by the way, male bees won't eat unless a female feeds it. <laughs> okay. So at the end of the summer. When, when the winter's starting to approach and the bees are recognizing we have a problem with resources, they round up all the male bees and they kick them out where they either starve or they die. So the male bees are good for only one thing. Okay, and you can pretty much guess what that, what's, what that thing is. And, 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 and in the process of, of that activity, they, they lose a pretty vital organ. <laughs> and, 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 and so, you know, I, I told you, if he acts like a male, treat him like a male, don't go that far. <laughs> One of the other interesting things about the male bee, the drum, is he born on fertilized eggs. When the queen is laying eggs, she'll pick, because she's made with so many different um, drums. And she's got all these different uh, uh, genes. genes or traits. traits that she can pick from. She will lay, if she, she feels that she needs uh, more honey, they'll actually lay bees that will lay eggs that will produce more honey. Or if they need uh, more defense, they'll uh, lay eggs for more defense. Or she can lay an unfertilized egg and become a drone if they have a shortage of drones, mm -hmm. depending on the time of year and if it's mating season or not. So um, it's rather interesting what the queen can do, and what a, uh, as we were saying earlier, a worker bee, if they don't have a queen and can't produce a queen, the worker bees will actually produce, lay eggs, but they'll only be drones, and with the idea to keep the genetics in high growth. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Yeah. So my question is, is there anything that we can do when we're working in our gardens to minimize the stuff by a bee? Oh. What to do when it lands on you? Oh, I, I say if a bee lands on you, first thing to do is look at it. Can you tell the difference between no? Just, 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 just look at it. In, 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 in because, in, in watch its mouth. Because in all likelihood, if you haven't done anything to irritate that bee, that bee's probably landed on you to take a rest, or maybe to take a um, taste of your perspiration because they do like the salt. All right. See if they're just there resting, and taking a lick of the salt. All right. Mm -hmm. And if they are, just do that, and they're gone. Okay. okay. But if you see the bee. So that's when it stings. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, if you see the bee, you know, arching her back, okay, as if she's pointing that stinger down, that's, that's when you know you're in trouble, okay? And she's getting ready to sting you. And you, in, in, instead of whacking at it like that, brush it slowly like that, okay? If you happen to have a trowel or something like that in your hand, a very slow and gentle brush. And we'll send it on. We'll send it on its way. So, can you talk about the difference between the male bee and the female bee? 
between the different types of, you know, the, the Voss you. versus Warnet versus Yellow Jacket versus Honeybees? Because I think not everybody knows the difference. I'm not really up to speed on all that. I mean, I... Just I visually. You know, well, you, yeah, okay. When you see them, you know the difference. Well, I, I, I would say, hey, take a look at these. Right. <laughs> okay. It's the biggest thing you want to look for. Is it hairy bee? It's hairy. It's a bee. Okay. It doesn't have a lot of hair. You pass that over. Yellow yellow yellow. You want to? Here. Okay. Yeah, honeybees are hairy, but so are bumblebees. Bumblebees. Are okay. Yeah, bumblebees are big and round. Okay, but they're big and round. Y yellow jackets. Yellow jackets have no hair on them. Their colors are much more vibrant. Um, yellow jackets are carnivores, so they're going to eat meat. All right, and and they're they're a little bit more aggressive than honeybees are. Okay, um, and I'm not really up to speed on the wasps and all the other ones. I, I can't speak on those. No, if you look at it, if you look at the bees that are frequenting your flowers, chances are it's going to be a chances are it's going to be a bee, but it's going to be a mason bee, could be a fly, um, or it's going to be a bumblebee or a yellow or. Uh, Honeybee. Uh, but if you look at them, almost all of them have hairs on them. Where, as he stated, they're, the yellow jackets are hairless, they're a little more aggressive, their sting hurts a lot more. And yeah, the yellow yeah. jackets are in the ground. Well, the, 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 the stingers don't have that barb. And they don't have a barb, so they can sting you multiple times. Yeah. So, so, yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah. So, you know, it's. Uh, um, most of the time, the yellow jackets are after your dinner or after your soda. Um, and they're very active late in the summer. And they're yeah, very active. Exactly. In fact, they yeah. steal a lot of mm -hmm. honey. Uh, they attack a lot of honey beehives mm -hmm. late in the summer. Yeah, are, going after the honey. They yep. are a beneficial insect. They will help your garden because they do eat a lot of um, aphids. Very aphids and and um, caterpillars and things like that that might be going on in the garden. So don't just leave all of them or have. I'm, I, I'm starting to think it's better I hold this because if the glass breaks, we have a problem. <laughs> so let me let me go here, and some folks can come around the back side. There's some on the back side. You can look at them also. Okay. And, and what, what I'm what I'm looking at here is so here here are some cells over here. You can see this is nice and shiny. All right. Yeah. So that's that's a cell that's got some nectar in there that hasn't yet been capped over. Yeah. When you see people, you see oh, honeycomb lifted and honey dripping off. Yeah. yeah. With that, I mean, you're saying these are sealed. The honey's yeah. inside. Yeah. That dripping process is after they've broken the seal. So what? Are, yeah. Yeah. So are, are, are they annoyed because they want to get out and move around, or they want to sleep now because it's dark? They 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 probably miss their queen. Okay. All right. Okay. So, um, yeah, they're not and they're not happy about the light. Okay. You know, and being jostled around, they want to go home. Yeah. <laughs> so is the life of the drone because of what it does, and it's shorter than the worker bees? Um, well, I'm not sure what their natural life expectancy is. I do know that they get they, they get booted out at the end of the season so they're, because they're because they're useless. Yeah. Well, they're useless <laughs> they, to the They've already hive. done right. They've already done what they needed to do yeah, by doing yeah. the eggs. So, so the yeah. Queen flies up in the spring. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 So, so, so the queen will the queen will mate with up to t up to fifteen different drones, and she'll store the sperm in a gland called a spermatheca. So when she lays an egg, she gets to decide whether that egg is going to be fertilized and become a female, or not be fertilized and become a male. Will the drone is the drone able to fertilize more than once? No, because he loses he loses his endophallus in the process. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And this would stay in your frame outside, insulated for the winter. Yeah. This this would be inside of a box like that. Um, and I've got like two or three of them. Right. Oh, I hope you get a big next year. Me too, because I'd like to make some money finally. <laughs> No, I've got I swamps. Have, you didn't have a good apple last year. No, I know. Last year, 
Oh, the year that you got the six pounds, that was the year, I think, that... And then that we had the year with no peaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there were a couple of hours with, with some of the big groups. <laughs> Okay. Oh, thank you. Nice. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> I might want to thank you for coming. Very My pleasure. Hey, thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.